Okay, I want to discuss now some other interesting oscillation. Again, simple harmonic. And that is liquid in a U-tube, as you see there. If I have here a tube, which has everywhere, it's open on both sides, and everywhere the same cross-section, and I put a liquid in here, in equilibrium, just like that. And the, t the liquid has mass m, it had density rho, the area of the tube is A, and the length of the liquid is L. So this is L. I'm going to offset it, the liquid, and I want it to see oscillate, and I want to see whether I can calculate the period of the oscillation. The total mass of the liquid that I have, the total mass is the volume, which is the area times the length times rho. I'm going to offset it so that this is higher over a distance y. So this then is lower over a distance y. So this distance is also y, same as that. So the liquid now is here, and then I release it, and it will start to oscillate. Well, when it starts to oscillate, there comes a time that the liquid, the whole liquid is going to slosh back and forth, and so everywhere in the tube, the velocity at any moment in time will be the same because the cross-section is not changing. It's the same everywhere. So if there's a certain velocity here, v, then it's the same as the velocity here, as the velocity there, as the velocity there. And that, of course, is y dot. That's the first derivative of that position here. I'm going to write down the conservation of total energy, mechanical energy. I assume that there is no energy loss, although there probably is some friction inside the liquid will probably generate some heat, and that will cause some damping. You will see that when we do the experiment. For now, I will assume that that's not the case. So what now is then the total energy of the system? That is the sum of the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. And if we assume that that's constant, we will be able to find the period of the oscillation very shortly, as you will see. The kinetic energy of the liquid is easy. That is one-half m times the velocity squared, and the velocity we agreed is y dot squared. Now the potential energy. I call the potential energy here, I call that u equals zero. When the liquid is standing here and the liquid is standing here, I call that potential energy zero. The mass that is now above this level here, I call that delta m, and delta m is the area times y times rho. This is how much mass there is here. It was taken away from here and is put here. How much work do you have to do to take this liquid and put it there? Well, that's the same when you take this liquid and put it here. And when you bring this liquid, which was there, here, then you have moved it up over a distance y. And so the gravitational potential energy increases by delta m, this is the amount of mass here, times g, times h, and h is y. mgh, remember, that's the increase in potential energy. And so I move an amount of mass, which is delta m, I move it over a distance y. I bring it here, but that makes no difference, of course. And so this is the total energy, and this is now a constant. So I'm going to substitute in there the A, L, and rho, so I get one-half A, L, rho, velocity squared, 
plus a rho g, and I get a y squared equals a constant, because I have a y here and I have a y there. We've done this before. This is the conservation of energy, and in order to find the period of the simple harmonic oscillation, we take the time derivative. By the way, before we do that, this is an, uh, this was delta m, and this is an a, right? Yeah, a rho, yeah, that's it. So we lose a, we lose rho, and we continue with what we have. And so we're going to take the derivative versus time of this equation. That gives me one half L, the two pops out, and the two becomes a one, so I get two y dot, then I apply the chain rule, so I get y double dot. Here I get plus g, the two pops out, becomes two y, and then I get the chain rule y dot, and that equals zero. I lose my y dot because I have y dot in both terms. This two eats up this two, and so I find that y double dot plus two g divided by L times y equals zero. And that was my goal, because this is clearly a simple harmonic oscillation, because this is a constant. And it will oscillate in the following way, y equals y max times the cosine of omega t plus phi, and this is the angular frequency, which is directly related to the period. Omega, angular frequency, equals the square root of two g over L, and so the period will be two pi times the square root of L over two G. So this is the period for a oscillating liquid. Notice that it is the period that you would have had, for, would have obtained from a pendulum if the length of the pendulum were L, L over two. Not at all obvious. Not at all intuitive. You see our setup here. I have to know what L is, and that is not so easy. Because of this radius here, if I measure L on the outside, it's substantially larger than on the inside. You may not think it's a big difference, but it's huge. It's a nine centimeter difference between the outside and the inside. If I take the average value between the two, if I take the average, I find 72 centimeters, and I could be off by one. If I use this number for L and I substitute it in this equation, then I find my predicted period, which is 1.204, and because of this error that I have of one, that would give me an uncertainty of about 0 0.01 seconds. However, before we start measuring it, and I will do ten oscillations to get a reasonable, accurate result, I want to warn you. I make a prediction that the period that we will measure will probably be larger than this. And I can think of two reasons. First is that the damping of this liquid will be huge. You will see how quickly it damps. In the past, we have never taken damping into account, and we won't do that in 801 but the damping has the effect on making the period longer. We've always ignored that, and in most of the demonstrations that we did, like just now, that was acceptable. It may not be acceptable for the liquid. But now there is a second point that I want you to think about. Is it correct that I take the average length, namely the average value between the outer length and the inner length? I don't think it is. I want you to think about why that is not correct. Look carefully where that L comes into my differential equation, and you will probably come up with the right answer. And I claim that the actual L that we should have taken is a little bit larger. I don't know how much larger, but it's a little bit larger. And so that will also make the observed period become larger than the predicted one. So I'm not too optimistic that we will go and hit this the way we want to hit it. But that's good, because that's where the physics lies, that you see that there are other factors that have to be taken into account. I'll turn this one on. Is it on now? Is it zeroed? We'll make it completely dark in the classroom. 
because you're going to see, otherwise you can't see the liquid. So you see the liquid now. Oh, you see these equations too. Okay, it's zero. So let me try to give this a, a swing, a large swing. It bent so enormously that I really want to get a very large swing. That's nice. Now, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ah, not bad. Twelve point one eight. Not bad. Get a little bit of light. Twelve point one eight. So observed. 10T, observed, is it 12.18? Okay, my reaction time is 0.1, so T observed is 1.2, let's make it 2, plus or minus 0.01 seconds. Oh, that's not bad. It actually, there is an overlap. If you add this one here, you get one to one, and if you subtract it here, you get also one to one. So it's not bad. I expected it to be 